Good morning, everyone. I appreciate your coming today. Uh, I'm here to discuss the Alexandria Police Department's internal investigative findings for the police-involved shooting of Mr. Taft Sellers, which occurred on February 18th of this year in the 3400 block of Duke Street. I would like to say that we at the Alexandria Police Department are dedicated to protecting life and property while ensuring fair and equal treatment to everyone. We value human life above all else. Any incident that results in the, life, the loss of human life is one of great tragedy. I wish to extend my deepest sympathies once again to the Sellers family and friends and Mr. Sellers of the death of Mr. Sellers as they grieve their loss. The purpose of the internal investigation was to determine if the use of lethal force and other actions that occurred during this incident were in the compliance with the Alexandria Police Department's policies and procedures. In July, Commonwealth's Attorney Randy Single cleared the Alexandria police officers involved in the shooting of any criminal wrongdoing. His release report states, quote, under these circumstances, the law clearly supports the conclusion that the officers were entitled to use deadly force in response and that they fired in self-defense, end quote. Our internal investigation determined that during the early afternoon of February 18th, Alexandria police officers were called to the 3400 block of Duke Street for a domestic situation involving a man with a gun. The officers who arrived on the scene of this incident were confronted by Mr. Sellers, and he was armed with a gun. The officers on scene took cover and commanded him to put his weapon down. They assured Mr. Sellers that he just wanted to help. Police and other witnesses verified Mr. Sellers did not comply with these officers' commands. Unfortunately, ultimately tragically, Mr. Sellers instead took an aggressive posture and pointed his gun at our officers. The officers feared for their lives and the lives of their colleagues. The officers fired on Mr. Sellers and continued to shoot until there was no longer a perceived threat. Five shots struck Mr. Sellers, who died as a result of the injuries sustained from the gunshot wounds. Our investigation revealed that Mr. Sellers had a loaded gun with him throughout this entire encounter. It is important to note that from the officer's perspective, this was a very tense and uncertain situation. It has been determined that from the time officers first arrived on the scene until the time Mr. Sellers pointed his gun at the officers was approximately 11 minutes. Confronting armed subjects is high risk and dangerous for police officers. Officers are trained to address such suspects as a lethal encounter. Officers engaged with Mr. Sellers for 11 minutes, negotiated with them, and only used lethal force when he pointed his gun at them. Alexandria Police Department policy allows the use of lethal force when, quote, an employee reasonably believes that the action is in the defense of human life, including the employee's own life, or in defense of any person in imminent danger of serious physical injury, end quote. The officer's use of lethal force has been determined to be objectively reasonable and in compliance with Alexandria Police Department policy, and it is consistent with police department training. No police department policies were violated in this incident. The officers involved in the shooting of Mr. Sellers have all returned to work following the conclusion of the internal investigation. In cases such as these, it is the policy of this department and city that reach out to the Civil Rights Division of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and ask them to review the findings of our internal investigation. We have handed over our case files to that organization and we await their review. Now, thank you, and I can take questions. Yes. Well, let me start with the first part of your question. Um, we had uh, approximately 10 officers. We know there were 10 officers who were involved in the direct shooting on this scene or not. Um, Mr. Sellers, as I stated, was actually struck five times that is known through the forensic examination and not shot 37 times. 
Um, that's probably a confusion with the number of rounds that were discovered. Uh, also, uh, Mrs. Seller's mother, who uh, unfortunately was on the scene to see this incident, uh, our investigation determined she actually was not in the position actually to see that part of the uh, incident. Uh, and I'll tell you, it's, the video is part of our criminal investigation, uh, so we will not release it to the Alexandria Police Department, but more importantly also, uh, out of respect for the family, we will not release that video for public consumption. Um, that is being addressed. However, uh, in your statement, um, uh, actually, we did not determine that there was an excessive amount of rounds fired. Uh, of the 10 officers who were involved in this scene, uh, seven officers fired their weapons. Three others on that scene did not, for various uh, tactical and other reasons, did not fire. Um, we obviously, in post-incident, will look at the efficacy of the accuracy of the shots fired. Some of the things that determine that is the angle that you were firing at the target. Uh, even though you can see it is partial, Mr. Uh, Sellers at the time was crouched in a stairwell that was a tiered stairwell. So some of the uh, structures around him was involved in some of the missing. It wasn't just simply accuracy. But we are reviewing uh, the shooting uh, as it relates to who shot what weapon and the training aspects around that. Okay, in this instance, I, I think most of my colleagues, and I'll speak to just Alexandria's case, sure. um, it's really appropriate force to meet force. Uh, when you're confronted with a man with a gun, and we know uh, post-investigation uh, that he had a loaded gun, we know for most of this scene he had a gun, uh, and when subsequent investigation revealed it was loaded and one in the chamber. No, he did not fire his weapon. However, when the officers are faced with a gun, which is lethal force, then they are trained to respond uh, with the possibility of lethal force themselves. So if you're pointing a gun or have a gun on any of our officers or any officers, uh, hopefully they're trained to have their gun ready to respond. So that's what we were in this particular situation. We knew early in this, indeed, the call came for a man with a gun. We got to the scene and very quickly we determined he indeed had a gun. So my officers were then prepared to defend themselves or someone else. It was in this particular case instance, only uh, at the point that Mr. Sellers pointed his gun at one of my officers that the rest of the officers fired their weapons. Um, we, as I indicated, uh, spent 11 minutes uh, on this incident uh, from the moment the first officer marked on the scene to the actual first shot was fired. Uh, during that time, uh, a little over eight minutes perhaps, uh, the officers had their weapons trained on Mr. Sellers, awaiting him to comply with our orders. And during that period of time, he moved about and stared at us and didn't respond to any of the uh, efforts to try and get him to comply. Uh, and then initially, uh, uh, we were hoping for that. But at the conclusion of the incident, unfortunately, it was at the moment that he pointed the weapon at the officer that we fired. So in our incident, clearly a case of uh, the officers defending themselves and other officers on the scene. Uh, I, I can't quickly to you, uh, I can tell you the nature of it was asking him, telling him that we are there to help him, telling him he does not have to do anything. Please show your hands. Uh, please put the weapon down, if you will. So there was a continuation of that kind of discussion. ...to us uh, from the beginning of this incident to the end. 
question uh, about the video, Barbara. I understand the reasons you don't want to release it, but would it be possible to let reporters see it so that we could verify the, the pointing of the gun? Uh, I, I understand as well that this man always carried a gun, which is legal in Virginia, and that his sister, when she called to report the incident, him, uh, said that he never uh, threatened her with the gun, that he wasn't intending to use the gun. So uh, is there a way that you would let uh, the reporters see this video? Uh, I'll start with the first part of your question. Uh, indeed, I agree with you. Mr. Sellers was, uh, for all intents and purposes to us prior to this incident, a law-abiding citizen. Uh, we had no reason to think he uh, of being a person of bad behavior. He did legally uh, carry his weapon in open carry, and indeed my officers in the past had encountered him with his open carry and never reacted violently or uh, erroneously towards him. We, we recognize his right to carry the gun. Um, so that, in this encounter, wasn't unusual to come up to a man we know who might be open carrying. Um, but on the subject of the video, uh, the decision by that is we take these as part of our criminal investigation and our normal practice here is never to release that to anyone outside that. We have shown the video to the family. Uh, not only did we show it to it, but so did Mr. Single in July during his thing. Because that's the salient point, as you are saying, is whether or not the family believes that they, we've done a clear and objective investigation. Uh, so we have also, in the in internal investigation, shown the family the video so that they could see the behavior that day that we saw on that tape. And we thought that was adequate. Yes. Not the handguns that fired. Does that, does that, on the other side of this, does that speak to, uh, you know, perhaps more training? I mean, what, what, what would you say about that? I mean, are, are just handguns just uh, more difficult to uh, get right? Sometimes it's circumstances and it is what you're facing. It so happened that the rifle and the shotgun were the closest weapons to Mr. Sellers that day. Some of our officers determined that the long guns trained on him were sufficient. Others, when they arrived on the scene and took a position, did not feel it was appropriate to leave their position of cover to go and get a long gun. So there's decisions the officer makes on the scene as to what they think they're going to be effective at, plus whether or not we had adequate coverage. So as stated, the two weapons that actually hit him were the shotgun and the rifle, and they also happened to be the two weapons closest to Mr. Sellers. Yes, sir. Tell us how long the conversation lasted, the 11 minutes. Do you have any idea how long the gunfire lasted? We know 37 shots were fired. Is that the person who uh, fired the most rounds determined in the, the investigation was the officer holding the rifle, uh, and he fired 11 rounds. His entire 11 rounds were shot in three seconds or less. Um, I'm sorry. Three seconds or less. He was also the person who called out ceasefire for everyone else when he saw that the threat was no longer there. And aside from them being cleared for the, the actual shooting, has there been any disciplinary action or any administrative action taken against anybody in respect to this incident on any other matter? No, there have been no sanctions against any employee or any of the officers there that day. Our determination uh, in the investigation was that they did act within all of our policies and procedures here at the police department and the city government. Um, as I said, it was a fairly clear uh, um, investigation with outside witnesses and officers who stated that the penultimate moment that occurred in the shooting of Mr. Sellers is when he pointed the weapon at the officers. We had uh, a couple of witnesses who were filming at the McDonald's directly across the street uh, who had a line of sight on the incident. You um, mean like cell phones or? Cell phone. Um, you said that, uh, you know, you guys have determined that the officers acted in compliance with current policies and procedures. Uh, given uh, the Commonwealth attorney, uh, Mr. Sengel's report that mentioned while they were justified, you know, perhaps some of the force was excessive. Are you reviewing any of these policies and procedures at this time? 
Okay, I do not remember a statement, I'd have to review it, where he says the number of rounds was excessive. Um, uh, what he did do uh, in a very factual way is note in the, uh, through our CSI uh, investigation and film and forensics, note that the number of rounds that were fired. Uh, and so it would be naturally concerning for us to review uh, the number of rounds that did miss. Uh, and uh, we are looking at that from a training aspects in terms of uh, the weapon used and a different weapon you can use. Only thing we could have done in this scene uh, preliminarily that may have increased this is more long guns. Everybody was correctly uh, uh, using their weapon in the face of this lethal force from Mr. Sellers. So uh, while it's concerning, uh, and we will look at that as a review, uh, the number of rounds uh, fired was not determined to be excessive by us at all. Um, I'll talk about open carry, okay? Uh, open carry for any police department, whether it's Virginia or any state in the United States, is a challenge. Uh, when you go to a scene, uh, and let me state that we are uh, people who are enforcers and also abide by the law. The law of the state of Virginia is that you're allowed to open carry, and you're allowed to conceal with proper permits. And so we abide by that law, and we train to that law. So you do indeed respect people. As I said earlier, even in the case we talked today, we have encountered Mr. Sellers before an open carry, and nothing happened in that encounter other than a conversation, and he walked away. That was the appropriate thing to happen. We respect the open carry law. It is difficult for officers, however, because when citizens call, they generally say the man has a gun. That all automatically should have my officers be very careful because we want to determine how you're using the gun, and indeed, do you have it legally? Are you displaying it legally? So it is a challenge for all police officers in the state of Virginia because any time a gun is introduced into any scene that an officer comes to, we have to be very careful, not only for our lives, but the lives of citizens. So it's a greater challenge, but it's one I think we've successfully met here in Virginia by recognizing the citizen's right to do that. Well, uh, that's um, it's okay. Uh, that investigation, obviously, we started an immediate internal investigation on that case, and um, we will be looking into that policy. Um, sometimes it's necessary for police officers to take their weapons home. We do have written policy that governs the proper handling of that weapon and securing of that weapon at home. Uh, so that's active investigation right now. But we have. Uh, uh, in the circumstances we're describing, uh, the weapon should have been secured more, uh, better than it was in a different manner. That is, that is contrary to preliminarily our policy, but I don't want to preempt the investigation, but we are looking at that. In this circumstance, our policy clearly stated the, the gun should have been secured in the home and locked away. Chief, obviously the officers who shot, fired the fatal shots know that they're the ones who fired the victim. Can you talk a little bit about how those officers deal with the knowledge that, that they killed a man, whether justified or not? Obviously that has to take a toll on someone. It does indeed. Um, in this room today, I've got some gray-haired people who have been part of some shootings during their career. They never forget them. Uh, they, they come back to your memory. And uh, you never, in a sense, get over it because, as I stated earlier in this thing, we're so geared towards trying to protect human life. When you have to take a life, it's the ultimate act of a police officer that he does not want to do. But you're going to be faced with it in your career. In this instance, I had 10 officers there, three of whom who were less than two weeks on the scene of being a police officer. 
I've been on the scene all my life now, 30 plus years, and fortunately never had to shoot anyone or shoot at anyone. The suddenness of this guy, the risk associated with any time the next call comes, you have to be prepared for that. And then you have to take and depend on your training and your judgment and your knowledge to do the right thing. This has been uh, a little longer than we wanted it to be in terms of concluding the investigation. It's hard on those officers to go through this with their families and themselves. They're not sure of the outcome. The steps they go through in the criminal investigation is as any investigation or any other citizen. And whether the Commonwealth will indeed rule this a proper shooting and not charge you criminally. So they have to go through that as any citizen would go through that. Then they have to wait for our review to find out whether or not there would be sanctions against you administratively for your actions. So it is a long process for them. But the pivotal thing here, if you talk to any one of them, is coming to grips with the fact that they actually were involved in the taking of another life. And we do provide uh, psychological services and counseling for our officers after these things happen. Uh, It's mandated that they receive these services before they can go back to work to ensure that they have some health in their thinking and what they're doing. But I assure you, this incident will stay with them all their life. Chief, you said the investigation has been passed down to the FBI? We uh, elect, uh, uh, as part of our protocol, that if we have any police shooting uh, to contact, which we did within days of the shooting, uh, the Department of Justice and say, we have had a shooting in the city of Alexandria. We would like for you to review our internal investigation once completed. We have done that for a couple of decades now if it's involved in any police shooting. So yes, we send the case to them for their review and allow them hopefully to take a independent look at what we've done here in the city of Alexandria. Do you know how long that will take? I do not. It depends somewhat on their caseload and what's happening um, as, as to trying to complete some transparency and getting to our public on this issue. Uh, we also will be going voluntarily to the Human Rights Commission within a couple of weeks to present our case to the city's commission and the public on what happened in the shooting. One more question, anyone? Okay, I thank you very much.